Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Modern Glory video. In today's episode, we are going to be taking a look at the golden rules of playing the Imperial Guard. Whether you are a new player getting into 40k for the first time, starting off with the Guard, or you are a veteran who wants to expand their collection into the Emperor's true finest, these guiding principles will help you on the battlefield. To be clear, this video is not a comprehensive guide on everything you need to know about collecting the dog soldiers of the Imperium, but rather it is a guideline. It will point you in the right direction and it will help you get to grips with the fundamentals of the Ashton Militarum. So with that in mind, let's fix bayonets, be ready for blood and charge right into today's video. So our first golden rule of the guard is victory requires sacrifice. Look, when you get down to brass tacks, the guard is a horde army. You're going to have a lot of infantry in your force. And those infantry are not particularly powerful. Sure, they can chip some damage off here and there, and they might win a localized firefight against a peer unit. But by and large, your infantry are not there to do damage to the opponent. They are there to die for the emperor. Now, you might be thinking, surely that makes my infantry bad. That makes them useless, and I should concentrate on taking more units that can do damage to the enemy. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you don't include a solid core of infantry in your force, you will lose more games than you will ever win. You see, there's a saying we have in the guard. It always comes down to the infantryman and his rifle. It doesn't matter how many big guns you've got. If you haven't got the bodies to push forward, to take ground and to hold objectives, then you might do a lot of damage to your opponent, but you're going to lose the game on victory points every single time. Simply put, without your infantry, you're not going to be able to play the mission and therefore you're not going to be able to win the game. Now, individually, your guardsmen are not much to look at. In fact, they're little better than cannon fodder. This means you're going to need a lot of them because you're going to take a lot of casualties. The vast majority of your offensive maneuvers are going to be conducted by your infantry slogging forward through no man's land. It's not uncommon for guard commanders to have to commit 20, 30 or even 40 infantry to take a single objective or complete a secondary mission in a game of 40k. And out of those 40 bodies you might have thrown into the fight, you'll be lucky if 10 of them make it to the end of the game. The brutal reality of the situation and something that sets the guard apart from more elite armies like marines or custodies is that you may have to sacrifice every man under your command. I have played games where I've taken 95% casualties and still won the game. If you have to lose men to win points, it is a sacrifice you should be willing to make. And remember, it is a guardsman's life to die. It is our job to send them where they can die. You should never be afraid to spend the lives of your men, but you should never waste them. And that last part is also very true. Just because you'll be taking a lot of infantry doesn't mean you can callously waste them and throw them away. I have lost track of the number of games I have seen lost because a guard commander got overconfident in the number of bodies he had in his list and he quickly churned through them in the first two or three turns of the game. This meant that when it got to the late game, he didn't have the mass that he needed to hold onto the ground and objectives that he had taken. Now, before we move on to the next golden rule, I know some people are going to have a question, which is how many infantry should I be taking in my army? I tend to say in a standard 2000 point game, you want between 90 and 120 infantry in your list. This doesn't just have to be infantry squads, Cadians, Death Corps. It can be kind of anything. So if you've got 60 Cadian shock troopers and then a couple of squads of Kazakhin and some stormtroopers, that's fine. At the end of the day, as long as you can get that number to 90 or 100 and they're proper infantry, not ones that are going to be sitting back and doing fire support, but ones that will be pushing forward on the offensive, that is a good rule of thumb to have. Another way of looking at it is you want 25 to 30 infantry in your army for every 500 points in your list. 
But it's not just about dying for the Emperor. It's also important to make the other son of the bitch die for his god as well. And this is where our second golden rule comes in. Tanks are the backbone of the guard. Your armor is the main source of damage in your army. It's where all of your direct fire big guns are located. It's also where your range advantage is going to come from. You do have some specialist infantry that can do a lot of damage, but you tend to find they need to get pretty up close to engage the enemy. And when they do that, they're gonna be at risk and they're probably gonna come in, do some damage and then die. Tanks consistently deliver that damage turn after turn. I have been to tournaments where my opponent has been so busy dealing with my infantry pushing forward and taking objectives and putting pressure on him that my tanks have gone the entire event without a single one dying. And before someone gets clever in the comments, that's not because I didn't take any vehicles to the tournament. I'm talking about taking four or five Lehman Russes to an event and not losing one of them over the course of the entire weekend. Having this reserve of firepower that you can draw upon is vitally important because not only is it going to allow you to formulate long-term game plans, you know that this flank is going to have two battle cannons, these heavy bolters available every single time, and therefore you can plan ahead more than one turn, which if you can learn to do that is a very good skill in 40k, but it also means that you're going to be doing damage to your opponent. And by doing damage to him, you're actually increasing your own survivability. It's what I like to call indirect durability. The more of your opponent's models that you can take out of the game, the less damage output he has. The less damage output that he has, the more of your own models that are going to survive turn on turn. But on top of this, of course, your vehicles bring a lot of direct durability to your army as well. Guard tanks tend to be big, thick slabs of armor bristling with weapons. They tend to have a very high toughness and also a good armor save. We don't have things like invulnerable saves or energy shields or anything like that to stop the really big stuff from coming through and blowing us up. But against the majority of enemy firepower, you're pretty durable. And what's kind of interesting is traditionally, point for point, Guard vehicles have been some of the most tanky in the game. When you compare them to their equivalents in other factions, ours do seem to get a lot of bang for their buck. And that is because guard vehicles are woefully uncomplicated. They are big metal boxes with big boomy guns on top. And we don't really get any special frills and therefore you're just paying for what you get, which is firepower and armor. There's a great saying in the old 6th edition guard codex, which really sums up how you want to be thinking about your armor. Though the enemies of mankind may employ dark sciences or alien weapons beyond humanity's ken, such deviance comes to naught in the face of honest human intolerance backed by a sufficient number of guns. Long story short, don't worry about your opponent's tricks and what shenanigans he might be up to. Use your vehicles to achieve fire superiority. If you win the firefight, you will win the game. As with the previous rule, I know that a lot of new players are going to be thinking, okay, but how many tanks do I actually need Morning Glory? Well, obviously you can collect as many models as you want. If you want to pull together a full armored company and you just like to have lots of different Lehman Russ and stuff, that's great, go for it. But when we're talking about a 2000 point or standard size game, you want to be thinking of taking a minimum of four pieces of heavy armor. Now that might be four Lehman Russes, whether they're tank commanders or not, four of your main battle tanks. Or you might want to take three Lehman Russes and a Rogal Dawn, or maybe even just three Rogal Dawns. However you slice it, you want to be taking four bits of big tank in your army. But speaking of firepower, let's move on to our final golden rule. Infantry win firefights, tanks win battles, but artillery wins wars. You need to shatter their sky. Indirect fire, be it from your basilisk, manticores, field ordnance batteries or mortars, is vitally important for victory on the battlefield. You see, many enemy armies will not want to engage in a fair fight with you. I know, the curs, the cads, the wholesome knaves, but it is the truth. 
Most armies will try and achieve some kind of localized superiority against one of your flanks. They will try and get some force concentration whilst you are spreading out and achieving great combat width. As a result, it is not uncommon for your opponent to hide many of his units behind ruins and other line of sight blocking terrain. This means that your tanks won't be able to engage him, but when he is ready and the time is right, your opponent will be able to jump out and get the drop on you, inflicting big casualties before you've had a chance to respond. This is where your artillery comes in. It leaves no place for your opponent to hide. If he's trying to let you come forward and he's trying to wait until you fall into his trap, that's not going to work if you have the option of simply sitting back and pounding him to dust with your artillery. Indirect fire allows you to turn the tables on your opponent. It massively disrupts their game plan. They can't just hide back and try and win on points. They can't be sneaky and try and skirt around the edges of your force. They just don't have that option. The entire time they're messing around trying to do that kind of stuff, they're just getting hit by high explosive shells. On top of this, but artillery, even light artillery like mortars, really forces your opponent to commit units to holding objectives. If he tries to put a lone squad of five space marines or sister battle or some other battle line troop on a backfield objective, hoping that those five models will hold it whilst the rest of his force can push forward, he can get the maximum damage output, he's going to be sorely mistaken because the moment your opponent just puts a token force to hold his vitally important home objective, you're going to blow that unit away and then your opponent's in a really tricky situation. Does he continue to push forward and fully commit to taking the middle ground? That might work, but if you're able to hold him, he's definitely going to lose on points if he can't even hold his own objective. Or it forces him to redirect forces to hold that vitally important backfield objective. That means there's less stuff coming at you. And suddenly that starts feeding into the next two points, or should I should say our last two points, where you have infantry that are pushing forward and you've got tanks that are winning the firefight. By forcing your opponent to redirect forces, it means that he will not be able to kill your infantry as quickly and you're probably going to have a better advantage in winning that firefight. However, let me be clear about something. Artillery, by and large, does not have the damage dealing capabilities of your big guns. Your battle cannons, demolishers, vanquishers, all that kind of good stuff are gonna tear ragged holes in the opponent's ranks. But your artillery at best will harass him. They'll take a few units out here and there. They'll do a few casualties amongst a wide variety of squads. Unless you absolutely 100% concentrate your barrage, you're unlikely to kill a single enemy unit in one go with all of your artillery. This is something that can catch a lot of new players off guard and it can cause them to make some missteps in game. They think that just because they've got a big basilisk that it's just going to flatten an enemy unit. More often than not, it's just going to kill one or two marines. And that's fine, it's still doing its job of harassing the enemy, but don't expect your artillery to win you the game single-handedly. And this kind of leads me on to the main golden rule, the hidden golden rule, the one that I didn't mention at the beginning of the video. A good guard list will take advantage of all three of these things, the infantry, the tanks, and the artillery, and they will work in concert to achieve victory on the battlefield. A well-balanced hybrid guard army can be incredibly hard to stop if you're not ready for it. Overall, I would say if you want to aim for a rough guard army list, you can't go wrong with 120 infantry, four or five tanks, and three or four artillery pieces, be they mortars or field ordnance batteries, or whatever else you might want to have a pound your enemy from afar. And that, my little conscripts, are the golden rules for playing your guard. Victory requires sacrifice, the backbone of the guard, and shatter their sky. Of course, all of this is just like my opinion, man. Let me know what you think down in that comment section below. And if you've enjoyed today's video, make sure you smash that like button and subscribe to never miss an episode.
If you want to support the channel and also unlock a whole bunch of perks, please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By becoming a supporter, one of the biggest things that you can get access to is the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community of almost 1,500 active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got painting channels, hobbying, tactics, army lists, and of course, a pretty spicy meme section as well. And I just want to take a moment to say a huge thank you to all of the latest channel members. So thank you to Somewhat Amusing, Armageddon Slayer, Oradina, Thumbtack22, Mark Barlow, Russell Serenka, Dallas Asosby, Help Me Please, and John Ma. Thank you guys for doing your part. I also want to do a shout out to the latest Patreon supporters as well. So a massive thank you to Evan Osborne Lomax, Elijah Jankowski, Simon Dolding, Cyberez, and Iron Nerd. And last, but certainly not least, I want to say a personal, heartfelt thank you to all of my top tier Patreon supporters. These are the War Masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the Call of Duty. So a massive thank you to Alan Blunt III, Bon Bon Vert, Mark Panconi, Ross Miller, Swordfish Trombone, John Stubbs, Diesel Fox, August Varney, and absolute rubbish. Seriously, guys, thank you so much. Without your generous support, I wouldn't be able to do Mordian Glory full time. And so you have my honest and eternal gratitude. Hope you all enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching. And of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.